Welcome. This is a video for the phonology module of Linguistics 101. In this video, we'll look at phonotactics. In particular, we're going to examine in detail the central role that syllables play in the organization and sequencing of sounds. Uh, we'll cover the central organizing principle of syllables, the sonority hierarchy, and learn how to build a diagram that maps out the parts of the syllable. Now, uh, one of the most obvious facts about languages is that they string sounds together differently. For example, uh, let's look at how uh, speakers of different languages modify English pronunciations. Uh, here's an English word, street. You can see it uh, transcribed there. Now, a Spanish speaker uh, might pronounce street as a street. Um, the R might be changed as well, but let's just focus on the, the insertion here. Um, and the reason for that change is to uh, conform it to the allowable sequences. Spanish doesn't allow these three consonant uh, beginnings like English does. Neither does, neither does Japanese, by the way. A Japanese speaker would be more likely to pronounce it something like sotorit, right? Um, they can't fit the same syllable structure uh, as English, and so they, they make these changes. Uh, it's not that any one of these sounds is impossible for a Spanish speaker or a Japanese speaker to produce. They do the R a little bit differently, but that's, that's not really what's driving this. Uh, so they're patching up the English to match the grammar that, that's at work inside their uh, uh, language production faculty. <coughs> so how do speakers know what's allowable in their language? Uh, what does that part of the grammar look like? Well, that is, you know, there is a part of the grammar that specifies what syllables can look like. And now, uh, you have probably dealt with syllables before, uh, whether you've been examining or making poetry in an English class, or seeing pronunciations divided up by a syllable in a dictionary. And uh, as with so many other concepts that you find in this uh, introductory linguistics course, uh, linguists have a particular way of defining a syllable. To a linguist, a syllable is a sequence of sounds with a single sonority peak. Simple enough, except what the heck is that uh, sonority business? Sonority is a kind of hierarchy. Uh, certain classes of sounds are more sonorous or have greater sonority than others. And this hierarchy is universal. All languages reflect this hierarchy in how they construct syllables. There are some details about how syllables go together that are distinct from language to language, but they all conform to this uh, hierarchy and the way that we're about to, to learn. So you see here, the most sonorous sounds are vowels. Any language will allow a vowel to be the sonority peak of a syllable. Remember, a syllable is a sequence of sounds with a single sonority peak. So vowels can always be those peaks. Next are glides. Some languages allow glides uh, to be that peak. Liquids, uh, nasals are the next most sonorous after liquids. Um, and remember that when you put them together, the glides, liquids, and nasals are called the sonorant consonants. So next to vowels, these three classes of consonant are the most sonorous. They're the sonorants and the obstruents non-sonorants are fricatives and stops. Fricatives have slightly more sonority than stops. Okay. Uh, you don't see affricates on this list because an affricate is essentially a sequence of a stop and a fricative, not really a whole new type of thing in itself. So how do we apply this sonority hierarchy to syllables? Let's take a simple one-syllable word like sit. Here we have its broad transcription. And when we're doing syllabification, we can work with the broad transcription. We don't need to get all the details of the narrow transcriptions. Uh, now let's set up the hierarchy above that, the sonority hierarchy above this transcription, like so, and go through sound by sound and note the sonority of each sound. So the S, for example, is a fricative. The I, uh, small capital I, that's a vowel. And the T is a stop. Okay. Now. If we connect these dots, we see that the peak of this sonority sequence is on the vowel. Uh, okay, that's fine. Now, the name for the sonority peak of a syllable is the nucleus. Uh, so we label it with a uh, capital N there connected to uh, the sound. 
uh, like so. And any sounds that precede the nucleus in a syllable uh, are called the onset. So we'll label that with a capital O. And any sounds that follow the nucleus we call the coda. We'll call them, label them with a capital C. Okay, that accounts for all the sounds, but it doesn't account for all the structure. Uh, together, the nucleus and the coda form the part of the syllable that rhymes. Think of other words that rhyme with sit. Fit, mit, bit, it. They all have the same nucleus and the same coda, but different onsets. Uh, so together, the nucleus and the coda are called the rhyme of the syllable, and we connect them like so to show that they're both part of that rhyme. And finally, all the sounds together, onset plus the different components of the rhyme, uh, are the syllable itself, and we uh, denote the syllable note in our trees with the lowercase Greek letter sigma, like so. So that's how you di diagram a one-syllable word. You find the sonority peak, then assign onset and coda to the remaining sounds. And, uh, but, but what if you have a word with multiple syllables? All right, let's look at the word farther. So here's its broad transcription, you see. Um, now we are going to look for some sonority peaks. Eventually you'll be doing this all in your head, but for now it's okay to lay it out visually to get a feel for it. So we start with a fricative, right? And then we find, then we have a vowel, a liquid, another fricative, and another liquid. Okay, so if we connect these dots, we have kind of a two-peak system, right? So this is, we're looking for sonority peaks. Um, and uh, each peak is a syllable nucleus. So we carry on by labeling the syllable nuclei. And because each nucleus we know is necessarily part of the rhyme, we'll put the rhyme, and it's all part of a syllable. So we'll build the full vertical structure as soon as we find the nucleus. Now, the first F sound, uh, its role is kind of obvious. It's got to be the onset of that first syllable. Right? It can't be part of the second syllable when it's before the nucleus of the first syllable. Uh, that would be kind of ridiculous. So uh, there we go. We've got an onset. Uh, but what do we do with those two consonants in the middle? We've got a couple of options, right? They could just both be part of the coda of the first syllable. They could both be part of the onset of the second syllable. Uh, or maybe they're split. One's part of a coda, one's part of an onset. So how do we make that decision? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The crucial test in situations like this is that after identifying the nuclei, we want to maximize the onsets. We want to make put as many things into onsets as possible. How do we know what can go into an onset? Um, you see if that's a sequence that could start a word in that language. Just like we saw here, the, the F, we knew the F had to be in the onset. There's nothing else it can go. Any sequence that goes right at the beginning of a word, before a vowel, has got to be an allowable onset in that language, because that's exactly where it's going. Here, this isn't at the beginning of the word, but if we could have this sequence at the beginning of a word, that would be good evidence. Uh, it turns out that we can't. We don't have any English words that start earth, earth, before any vowel. Uh, so we can't have that full sequence. But maybe we can have just the this sound. Uh, if you can think of a word that has that sound, uh, and that happens in plenty of English words, uh, then, these, though, so on, uh, so we know that that sound has to be an onset. But the R can't be an onset. We, we have established that they can't both be in the onset, because we can't start a word with that in English. Okay, so we've maximized the first onset. We've maximized the second onset. Anything that's left over after we've maximized the onset of every syllable peak, every nucleus that we've identified, everything else that's left over goes in codas. Okay. So this tree structure tells us that the first syllable is far and the second syllable is there, farther. Okay. Now, no, we don't have to have a coda on a syllable. Codas are optional. In English, onsets are optional as well. 
Languages vary, but that's the basic idea. Another thing to point out here is that we have two R sounds. The first one, in far, serves as a coda. The second one is a nucleus. Uh, and this seems a bit odd to some people uh, when they first see it. But remember that the nucleus is defined relative to its surroundings, right? The nucleus is the sonority peak. If you have a sequence of sounds with one peak, with one most sonorous sound, then it's a syllable, and that most sonorous sound is the nucleus. So if a nucleus is the most sonorous sound of all the ones immediately around it, well, if all the sounds immediately around it are less sonorous, then the peak might be somewhat less sonorous than otherwise. Here, a vowel is really sonorous, so anything going on either side is going to be less sonorous. Here, we have a liquid, but the only neighbor it has is a fricative, which is less sonorous. So that's how this liquid can be a nucleus. This one can't be a nucleus because it has a more sonorous neighbor right there, a vowel. Okay, peaks are relative. Uh, now, in English, we do have uh, some syllable nuclei that are vowels, uh, a lot of syllable nuclei that are vowels. We have some that are uh, liquids. Sometimes even nasals get to play the role of the syllable nucleus in English. Other languages differ. Some are more restrictive, maybe allowing only vowels as sonority peaks, and some even allow fricatives to serve as syllable nuclei. Uh, what is constant is that they all assign peaks according to the same sonority hierarchy. All right, let me give you one more illustration of syllabification before we wrap up here. Uh, here's a transcription of the word unstriped. Now, I know there's some nasalization and some Canadian raising that would happen here if we were to do the, the narrow transcription, but that's not our job at this moment. Our job here is just to syllabify, and we can do that just fine based on the broad transcription. Okay, now uh, I'd like you to practice this yourself. Try pausing the video here and identifying the sonority peaks. <coughs> okay, so you've identified the sonority peaks. Now, in this word, the two vowels a uh, and a uh, are uh, sonority peaks. Uh, you've probably identified those, I hope. Uh, but notice that the a uh, is part of the i diphthong. And because languages like English treat a diphthong as a single unit, uh, although we do know phonetically that it has two parts, we normally put both parts of the diphthong under the nucleus, like so. The next step, as we saw just a minute ago, is to maximize the onsets. Now, the first syllable has no onset. There's no sounds before it to, to be attached to that syllable. There are languages that require an onset, but English isn't one of them. We have four consonants preceding the second syllable nucleus. Uh, and using our test, what sorts of things can we see at the beginning of a word, uh, we find that NSTR, all four of them together, we never find that at the beginning of a word. But we do find STR in a fair number of words. So that's certainly an allowable onset. Words like string, straw, stripe, and so on. So the onset of that syllable is those three sounds. Now we've maximized the onset for both syllables. Uh, we tested the first one, there is no onset. That's as big as it can get. And the second one, we can put all three of those sounds in. Any sounds that are left over go into the codas, uh, like so. And you'll notice that some onsets, nuclei, and codas uh, consist of a single sound each, like in the first syllable here, and some consist of multiple sounds. So the onset nucleus and coda of the second syllable here, striped, uh, each has more than one sound. And we just branch the, from the, the letter for the, that part of the syllable uh, to indicate that. We, can, we call these uh, complex onset, complex nucleus, complex coda, as opposed to a simple onset, simple nucleus, simple coda. Now, there is one curious exception in English to the rule of uh, sonority peak that we've been talking about. So let's consider the word spuds. Uh, 
Now here I've already marked out the sonority level for each sound, and we notice there's that one peak in the middle, the vowel, but also at each end of the word, the sound at the very end is more sonorous than the consonant closer to the center. And yet spuds, you know, if you're a native speaker, if you deal with the poetry at all, you won't think of spuds as a three-syllable word. It's a one-syllable word. Um, so what we'll do here, we're going to just say that the alveolar fricatives, the S and the Z sound, are exceptions. Uh, although they do seem to form peaks in situations like this, they cannot form syllable nuclei on their own. Okay. This is the one exception to the sonority peak test for syllable nuclei in English. Uh, so watch out for it. Okay, so this is how we determine the syllable structure of a word. First, we identify the sonority peaks. Uh, we label these as the syllable nuclei. Then we add the rhyme and syllable nodes above the syllable nucleus uh, for vertical completion. Uh, once we've piled up the, the labeling above the nucleus, then we maximize onsets. Uh, we do that for every syllable in the word. Once we've done that for every syllable in the word, then any sounds that are left over can go into the coda or codas. And uh, then it's worth just checking at the end that every sound in your transcription has been assigned to a role. Okay. <clears throat> now that is all for this video on phonotactics and syllables. Uh, in this video we looked briefly at how languages differ in the way they string sounds together. Then we covered a very specific linguistic definition of syllable, uh, introduced the sonority hierarchy to support that definition, uh, and we applied these ideas to mapping out the syllable structure of English words. Uh, you should now be able to identify the parts of a syllable, onset, nucleus, coda, rhyme, diagram syllables for English sounds following the procedure that we've looked at in this video. And uh, yeah, those are the main uh, analytical skills you should have. Now, as a scientist speaking to university students, I feel it's appropriate at this point to mention that there is more to syllables than what we've covered here. Uh, there are patterns in the world's languages, even in English, that can't be explained uh, just with the rules we have here. They need to be elaborated uh, a little bit. Uh, for example, certain sounds can belong to multiple syllables at once. Uh, these are called ambisyllabic sounds. Uh, and there are other more systematic ways of dealing with sounds like S and Z, which seem to break the rules of sonority peaks uh, when, when they, they seem like they, they should be able to form syllable nuclei, but clearly they don't. So there's other ways to approach that. So it's good to know what you might get if you, if you go deeper than this course uh, in what you might get in terms of understanding syllable structure. Now, I opened this video by pointing out that speakers of some languages mispronounce English in a way that systematically points to a different phonological grammar. So your task for the end of this video is to do a bit of, bit of digging and see if you can articulate the differences between English, Spanish, and Japanese in terms of the syllable structure we've investigated here. What specifically is or is not allowed in each language, and how does that, uh, how does that motivate the kinds of uh, insertions that we saw in those earlier slides. Uh, this is rather advanced reasoning, but I, I know you can do it. You know you can uh, look into this. Pay attention uh, also to what has been highlighted as universal in this video and what's been identified as specific to, to English, because that that may help in your analysis there. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.